Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this short training, we're gonna take you through what happens to a person during trauma and also what needs to be present during trauma treatment and trauma therapy. It's Ryan Hassan here, joined by Matt Nettleton. We are trauma therapists, have been for many, many years. We also have lived experience with trauma and we are the creators of Embodied Processing, which is a method of the bottom-up approach to healing trauma and nervous system dysregulation. So let's jump into the dot points we have here. What happens to a person during trauma? What we need to understand is Trauma isn't just a situation or a thing that happened because trauma is very subjective. One thing that is traumatic for one individual may not be traumatic for another individual and vice versa. Very, very subjective experience. So Matt, do you want to talk about a system in overwhelm? Yeah, so um, like you, you said something good then. So trauma is not what happens to us. It's what happens, what, not the event itself. It's what happens inside of us as a result of the event. And I think that's a quote from Dr. Gabon Mate. But um you know, so it, like you're right. So trauma is a subjective experience, but it is also uh, an experience that is created by our nervous system. So when a traumatic event happens or it's a distressing event, um, when there's an event that happens that puts our system into stress, what happens is the amygdala. So the part of the brain that's responsible for fight, flight, freeze, it will fire and it will send a message the brain will send a message to the organs and say, send all the blood to the limbs because we either have to fight, flee, fawn or freeze, etc. And what happens when a distressing event happens, we can say we spike up into a survival response. And what's supposed to happen is we're supposed to come back down to calm and safe when the event's over. And this is what happens in animals. You know, you watch a gazelle running from a, flying away from a lion and it will fly off. It'll go into fight, flight, freeze. Then it'll land and its system will come back to come and say, the threat is done. It's over. There is no more threat, but human beings, for whatever reasons, take our training. If you want to learn more about that, but just um, what happens with us is we can come up into fight, flight, freeze, and we never fully come back down again. So years later, our system can be stuck in this state of overwhelm. We can get stuck in fight, flight, freeze, so to speak. And what happens is a whole bunch of undigested, emotions um, get stuck in our system emotions like rage like terror um, like deep deep seated shame um, all sorts of um, states and, and emotions get stuck within our nervous system and our nervous system is stuck in threat mode so when we're in threat mode we're wired for protection and that's why after a traumatic event we can become dissociated you know it's like the escape when there is no escape so they say we protect ourselves by dissociating. We never really connect to experience again. We can disconnect from our body. Um, and we look at, you know, addictions. We look at, you know, anorexia. We look at so anxiety. What's anxiety except for that feeling I'm not safe, there's something wrong. That's a system stuck in a survival state. So we look at all these things and they're all, they're all symptomatic of a system that's stuck in overwhelm. And so I define trauma on a nervous system level as when we go up, we peak into fight, flight, freeze, and we never come back down properly. You know, we never find that plateau. We may get stuck halfway, you know, or we may get stuck in full blown PTSD at the top of the spectrum, or we may just experience low level anxiety, this feeling that our system's telling us something's wrong, some sense of impending doom. Um, but we never find that baseline. Oh, it's over. Um, and you spoke about the, those two words there, protection and connection. And, you know, we are very, very wide for connection as human beings. And this is a state that we ideally are in the majority of the time. And then we go into protection mode only when it's called for. And that's these very rare instances throughout our life, if we're um, being objective about it. But the truth is, instead of coming out of overwhelm or out of this protection into connection, we get stuck in that protection mode. And like you said, we can get stuck in protection mode for decades. Yeah, when it, when it was a, a situation that lasted maybe minutes, we can be carrying it decades later because we haven't been properly taught how to start processing and dealing with a lot of those states underneath. And you also spoke about stored emotional energy which is the next dot point and you know so many human beings are riddled with this stored emotional energy i use the analogy that you know when we come into this world we're kind of born with an invisible backpack on forget um you know in the womb stuff and intergenerational stuff you can cover that in our course um, but we're born with this invisible backpack and then as we go through life and we go through these heavy emotional events and we didn't process those emotions we didn't have a stable resource we didn't feel safe to process them it's like we chuck a potato in that backpack and we go through life and we're chucking all these potatoes in that backpack most people nearly everyone identifies with this you know and over time that backpack um, gets heavy right? It gets heavier, that load increases. And we might have a 
a wonderful DNM with a friend or we'll speak to a psychologist and we might let a couple of potatoes go, but more is generally going in that's coming out. And once that load hits a certain point, that can be when we're a teenager in our twenties, in our thirties, in our forties, we start to get symptoms. Yeah. And those symptoms can be depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction. I mean, what, what is addiction? What are coping mechanisms? We're trying to find um, some external vice to deal with our dysregulated nervous system that's nervous system that's overwhelmed based on what we've been through and so we find so many people with this backpack full of guilt shame anger fear sadness hurt all of them bundled in there that no wonder our system's overwhelmed no wonder our nervous system's dysregulated and no wonder life um, in general relationships work friendships family money trigger all these emotions in us because that backpack's full of emotions ready to be triggered and that's, you know, like, I just want to say as well, like trauma, in my view, isn't just necessarily like a big event that happens and we spike and get stuck. It can be accumulation of, you know, micro traumas of little stresses throughout our life that never get processed. And what happens is our nervous system becomes more and more and more stressed, having to wake up every day for work without knowing how to regulate my nervous system. And if that's a stress for me, uh, raising kids, all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, if, if I already have stress stored in my system what happens is i'm going to accumulate this stress it stays undigested stored emotional energy and i end up stuck completely in a survival state and that's when people have breakdowns and, and seek, seek professional help yeah it's so true and the next one is the the creation of deficiency stories so along with this system in overwhelm along with the stored emotional energy we start to get some uh conceptualizations around who we are as a human being and what the world's like and they're deficient because they can be that voice in their head that says i'm not worthy i'm not good enough i'm not worthy of love i don't love myself life is hard I need approval. I need validation. I don't trust men. I don't trust women. I fear conflict. There's a whole list of them, but they're these stories that I am deficient in some way as a human being, and I'm going to have trouble fitting into this world based on these stories of deficiency. And these go hand in hand with all of this overwhelm and stored emotional energy. And they start to feed off each other because if I have the story running that I'm not worthy of love, and then I have a deep feeling of shame and sadness that are congruent with that story, then that starts to become part of my identity. And this is how trauma really shapes our identity of who we are as a human being. And Matt was so right. Like a lot of um, people in the trauma field now talk about capital T and small T traumas as a way to kind of identify. We don't kind of split them up that way um, in the way we teach. But the truth is that, you know, we're all on a spectrum. We're all traumatized as human beings to some degree. It's kind of part of the human condition. And it does shape who we are as a human being. And so a lot of these stories and, and emotions can shape a real deficient sense of who we are in this world. And this is why we run into a lot of the same patterns, whether I have trouble in relationships, I have trouble with money, or I have trouble at, at work or with my family. It all stems from this emotions and these deficiency stories, which are bred during traumatic instances or a period of traumatic instances throughout someone's life. Yeah. And, you know, so what happens is the self-referencing mechanism turns on itself. You know, so we create uh, a sense of self that is unstable, that has low self-worth, that's based on feelings of shame and deficiency and lack. There's something wrong with me. You know, if I was to put it in just simple terms, like there is something wrong with me. And we carry that like deep in our gut. You know, it's not just a thought. It's like a deep-seated feeling. You know, within a traumatized person, there is something deeply wrong with me. And you know what? Like you said, it is a spectrum. Everyone carries that to varying degrees. You know, there's something wrong with me, dot, dot, dot. And I need to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so then I try self-improvement. Then I try this. Then I try that. Blah, 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 blah. All it coming from this sense of lack. You know, I'm trying to fix myself and my world. Like there's something wrong. Or there is something wrong. So right. true. And we've spoken about nervous system uh, dysregulation already, but we'll just touch on it again because what happens, our nervous system is this adaptive mechanism and it's searching for threat. And when it perceives, and the word is perceives, that there is threat, it will try and work out uh, the best response for that. And we can go into a sympathetic nervous system response, which is the fight or flight mechanism, or we can go into a parasympathetic or a dorsal vagal um, response, which is this shutdown, or, you know, it, which actually stems from a playing dead response in reptiles and then earlier mammals. Animals. And so our nervous system, when we have gone through these traumas and we have these undigested emotions and these stories of deficiency, the nervous system starts to adapt to threat. And this is why, like Matt said, we go into protection mode, because even though we can be, um, you know, 
safely in our house with our family and we we cognitively don't think there's any threat at work or going out our nervous system on a very deep level is perceiving threat all the time because it, it adapted that way because we weren't able to process these traumas now the, the thing is you know our, our our body and our mind is so adaptive that we, we survive these traumatic experiences by going into these states. So it's, it's, it's very needed at the time. But then when we fast forward 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the future, we still haven't let that part go. And we're still in that overwhelm and there's that stress state on a very, very deep level. A lot of people are very conscious of this, some not so much. They just feel like that bit of a hum in the background of anxiety that they're able to kind of keep at bay. But it all comes from a nervous system that has, that has been dysregulated. And never found homeostasis after the dysregulation, after the distress. Yeah. And so the way, you know, we talk about it and other people in the field, it's like this, this loop and that the loop wants to complete, but based on, you know, many, many factors we won't go into here is that a lot of the times the loop kind of half finishes and then gets stuck there. And so we kind of have all these open loops happening to us on a very, very deep emotional and, and, and energetic level. And they're looking for completion, but we weren't, sure how to do it at the time or in the future so a lot of this work is being able to help people close a lot of those loops and the more loops that we start to close the more the nervous system can start to calm down and when the nervous system calms down it's because we're perceiving less threat in the external environment and the last dot point here is orphaned parts so what happens as well when we go through these traumatic events in our life parts of us split off yeah our psyche splits we kind of take part of us and push it out here um, and this happens like i said it's a very adaptive mechanism we need to survive this experience when we're going through a traumatic experience it's very very painful and the only way that we can survive that pain is to split off if i'm not fully here i can survive this period of pain however long that period might be now, the issue then becomes we haven't brought these, we call them orphaned parts. We haven't brought them back in and reintegrated them. So we grow up to be an adult and we have all these orphaned parts out here. And it tends to be the world reflects those orphaned parts back to us. And that's the parts that really get us emotionally disturbed. You know, if we have a real issue with an authority figure when we're younger, because there was a trauma there, it could have been mom, dad, or someone else. Then all of a sudden, you know, 20 years later, our boss says something to us and it triggers all of this shame or all of this anger and sadness. And it can be to do because we've orphaned a part to do with authority figures and now life's reflecting that back. And then most people would just say, well, I hate my boss. They're an idiot. But the truth is we have an orphaned part there that we actually need to welcome back, which was the result of a trauma. Yeah. And, and you know, the way to welcome them back is to be able to do it within a safe container with the proper resourcing. So these, these parts, they become split off. So our psyche fragments, you know, it's a, like one of me and Ryan's friends uses the metaphor. She's a trauma healer and she says it's like Agent Smith and Neo, you know, when in the Matrix where there's thousands of Agent Smiths, <laughs> you know, and he's fighting all of them. It's sort of like that. But when we're properly resourced and grounded in a safe space and container, which we didn't have at the time of the trauma, and that's why we split them off. When we have that, these parts can get welcomed back in. And the way they get welcomed back in is to be able to experience them from a place of safety, you know, from, a, from a, a ground in a container. And that's the reintegration of, of the fragmented parts of the psyche. Absolutely. So there's some dot points there. Feel free to jot those down if you have a pen and paper. This is what happens to a person's system during traumatic events and also how it forms their identity and starts to play out later in life. And now as we jump over the page here, we're going to talk about what needs to be present. Um, based on what we've learned so far in regards to trauma therapy. So number one is nervous system awareness for both the therapist and the client. Um, as a therapist, then we need to be very, very aware of our own nervous system states, but also very, very attuned to the one the, the client's in. Um, because you know whether a client's in a very active, a very sympathetic nervous system state, or a very parasympathetic or dorsal vagal state is shut down, we need to be very, very aware of that because we need to obviously meet someone where they're at. Um, so whether you're a therapist watching this or you're someone who has, has been a client it's something to very much look out for how how attuned and, and we know how attuned um we are to a to a therapist or another person because we'll actually feel very very comfortable with that person when we're attuned if there's no attunement there then we tend to feel a little bit i'm not ready to open up i feel a little bit of threat going on here 
Next step is finding a resource. So this is just such an important step. Like Matt said, when we're talking about the orphaned parts, we need to welcome these parts back in from a place of safety. This is what we're talking about. Our resource is that feeling of safety. A trauma puts us in an overwhelmed state of fear. Okay, and then we can layer other emotions on top of that, the sadness, the shame, all of that. But the protection mechanism, the survival drive is one of fear. The reason why a resource is so important is because what's the opposite of fear? It's safety. Okay, it's a, it's a feeling of safety. This is connection, protection, safety, fear, whichever way you want to uh, dice it up, it's, it's the polarization, the polar opposite of that. So what happens that a lot of times we can run into issues is we want to process these traumas or we want to go into this stuff, but there's no resource of safety there. And Matt uses a wonderful analogy in that essence, you know, by having a resource, instead of falling off a five story building, we'll just fall off one step. <laughs> okay so it's, it's very very important that we have this safety so cultivating safety people who've had a lot of trauma they might not have felt safe in their body for decades okay so it's about finding that safety and then cultivating that we want to make that imagine it's a plant and we plant the seed and start to water it, it sprouts we want to keep growing that thing because the more safety we have over here the more we can meet these undigested life experiences on the other hand yeah and so the resource is what we pendulate to so you know that the issue and what causes re-traumatization in, in therapy or, you know, trauma-informed um, practices. And what happens is the person will, like I've seen this happen before in some modalities, the person will be taught to invite in the overwhelm. And what happens is they've got no capacity or no container to hold that. So what happens is they go into complete overwhelm and, you know, they, they call that working through the trauma but trauma like with, with a resource you know effective trauma therapy would be more like instead of just turning the tap on full ball onto the onto the um intensity and the sensations it would be learning to turn it on and turn it off turn it on a little bit and turn it off and turn it on and the turning it off is the ability to pendulate back to resource so you know for some religious people it might be an image of jesus that gives them a sense of safety and being loved for some someone else it might be a feeling of being grounded you know like really grounding down into the feeling of my legs it gives me and it doesn't have to be the word safety it could be stability you know um such support it's, yeah, support it's bringing in that that factor that wasn't there during the traumatic experience. And then from that ground, we grow in our capacity to then meet the trauma and pendulate back, meet the trauma, pendulate back. And we can turn the, um, the tap on to higher and higher states of distress without being hijacked and going into overwhelm and re-traumatizing ourselves. And so it's a very controlled um, process at EP. And because during trauma, what's one of the main things we feel? Being out of control. You know, being unsafe, being completely out of control. And just the process itself can really help people with that, I've noticed, um, get, help them bring back that sense of being in control. And when we find a resource, that sense of support, that sense of safety, we can start to come back in, in, down into our body, pendulate back to the resource, meet the distress that's here and the stuff that's undigested. Yeah, so true. So true. And like Matt said, like we spoke about earlier, how trauma is a very subjective experience. So is someone's resource is going to be very subjective as well. Like Matt said, Jesus could be a resource for someone, could be a, an emotional trigger for another person. It might be, you know, an, an image of, of mom or a school teacher that you felt safe with when you were a kid. Could be a place um, from when you were younger that you felt safety, but we find that and start to cultivate that. It's very, very important. We're also determining, you know, which of these orphaned parts we're ready to welcome back in. It's so important to determine what's the most thing in someone's life right now and also what do we feel properly resourced to be able to bring in so obviously we need to in therapy work out what's the next thing that needs to be brought back in and investigated and and experienced from a place of resource okay we can then gently from that place of resource start to invite back in that part and that part has in it all of that, that, that initial overwhelm that happened in the system, it has whatever emotions are attached to that part like I said guilt shame anger fear sadness hurt one or a multitude of them and it also has the stories um in there as well encoded into it those stories of there's something inherently wrong with me or i'm a bad person or whatever it might be when we're probably resourced we can welcome that stuff in like matt said without being overwhelmed and we can start to get curious we get very and you find a lot of the time when we start doing this work is that people after a, a session or two start to get more and more curious and less and less worried about what's going to come up because once you realize we can welcome these parts in and and integrate them again it's it's a really beautiful process. Yeah, 
So like I said, there'll be an emotion, you know, uh, attached. We want to get to the emotion that, that's underlying this part. Yeah. And we start to work with that particular emotion that's happening, whether it's shame or sadness, whatever it might be. And we also want to find out when that emotion and that part originated, because like I spoke about on the previous slide, let's say it is the, the, the boss who said something at me and caused a massive emotional reaction. My thing is, oh, I want to welcome back in the part that got reactive to that boss and now the thing is when we start to find the origin we can realize yes this could be something to do with mom or dad or an authority figure when i was five or ten or twelve years old but the idea is we find the roots of the tree because what's happening in our life today really is the branches and the leaves these are these symptoms and these reactions that are showing up that nearly always have much deeper roots so finding those deeper roots is so important that's why you know we're all about you know not just treating the symptomology that's coming up let's find out where this actually came from yeah. And then the next one is we start to process that. So different processing techniques can be used. You know, we offer an EP five different options or really 10, but five or 10 different options to process and work through these emotions. The truth is everyone's a little bit different. We all have a bit of a different disposition and what we kind of um, resonate with and what's works for us. But we find a processing technique that works from that place of safety and we start to work through these emotions. So like I said, it's like that invisible backpack. We're pulling out some of those bigger potatoes and using certain techniques with a trained therapist to be able to work through those so we can let them go for good um, because the truth is unfortunately we weren't taught how to properly process our emotions we weren't taught in school our parents didn't know because they weren't taught it's just a matter of fact and um, you know we see things possibly changing in this area with more emotional awareness and intelligence you know being paid its proper attention um, but for a lot of people we have to be taught how to properly process these emotions again because it's something we just haven't learned and now we're riddled with them yeah and, and just to, to just touch on something, you know, processing sensation, it's the essence of trauma work, you know? So when it comes to trauma, um, you know, modalities like cognitive behavioral therapy and psychotherapy or that sort of talk therapy, it's um, useless when it comes to trauma, because I say it's the equivalent of attempting to resolve trauma by talking, um, resolve a broken leg by talking about it, by trying to change my thinking. It's, it's embedded in my nervous system. And you know, I spent over a decade in talk therapy, re-traumatizing myself every time I went. Um, and I just ended up on more, more medication, feeling more shit, using more drugs. Um, you know, that my story is a whole nother thing, but you know, so the, the essence of all trauma therapy is being able to come back down and embody our experience, you know, to come back down into sensation, you know, to feel it in the body rather than think about it and cognize it. And it, it's, that's how we process sensation because that's where trauma is stored. You know, the thoughts are symptomatic of the unprocessed survival stress that's felt as sensation. And that's yeah. what we did. From. Just have a think, like how many times if you're watching this and you've you know, had anxiety or been anxious, maybe going to a social event or something and your body is riddled with anxiety and you're like, tell your body, stop being anxious. How many times has that worked? <laughs> never. You know, in the history of people having panic attacks and someone says, just calm down. It's never worked, right? Because we're speaking to a different part of the body. And this is where, you know, just cognizing everything, um, you know, do doesn't tend to work. So after processing the sensation, we want to find some resolution or completion. This is where we start to finish those unfinished loops hey, that have been happening in our body for, for years and years of time. And resolution and completion can look different um, for, for different people. You know, maybe we've completely processed an emotion and let it go. And now I feel no emotional charge around that part. Let's use the example of the boss again. And when they say something to me in future, I have no emotional reaction. I mean, that's some resolution and completion. Maybe we realize that, hey, you know, when I found origin, when I was eight years old and this thing happened to me, I decided I wasn't, uh, I was a bad human being. I can look back after I've processed that and go, that's ridiculous. No eight year old deserves to decide they're not worthy as a human being. You know, this, these can look like completion. Sometimes completion can be more subtle. It just means that the emotion might still be there, but now I have a bigger capacity to hold that emotion. Yeah. So instead of getting completely overwhelmed or drowning in an emotion, I'm able to kind of wade through that. And over time, that capacity gets greater and my ability to deal with and let these emotions go becomes greater as well. But we're trying to close up as many of those loops as possible. And that will look slightly different um, for different people. And my intention always when working with people, it's not necessarily to fully resolve an emotion, but to help give someone the capacity to be with their experience. Um, that's, that's the only, if there's a goal, that's the goal, you know, for me anyway, is to help someone grow in their capacity to contain and hold their own experience, you know, to be an island, a resource unto themselves, you know, eventually. <laughs>
Yeah, because then if if we're if we're okay with our direct experience of life, then we're, then we're okay. Because whatever's going to come come in future, we're going to be okay with because we've built that resource and built that capacity, um, which is so so important. So thank you for tuning into this video. Uh, we hope you've learned a little bit about what happens to a person during trauma and also what's really working um, in trauma therapy. And this is based on you know obviously our experience working with thousands of clients, but also the latest in neuroscience, the latest in trauma therapy. And we hope you've taken away something from this. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today.